Welcome back to another episode of Optica, Reflective Faith and Latinidad, where we are inviting you to open your eyes to see what God is doing. In our last episode, we began a short series about faith and advocacy. And I want to thank all of you who tuned in and sent me some questions and emailed our office and reached out to us through our social media platforms. You asked me to continue, and I promise I would, so here we are on Faith and Advocacy Part 2. And one of the questions you asked me to expound on was, what is advocacy? If you could give us a short working definition. Well, advocacy is when you and I collaborate with God in His justice-making and peacemaking in the world. That's right. God is at work not only saving people and saving families and saving the world, But God is also at work making justice and peace, shalom, in the world. And every time we advocate from a gospel-centered perspective, we are collaborating with God in his justice-making and peacemaking. So, in short, what is advocacy? It's lifting our voice and collaborating with God in God's justice-making and peacemaking. Of course, that can happen in many ways. When God tells the prophet Micah, he has told you, O mortal, what is good and what God requires of you, that first sentence is important. It's do justice. It's not just reflect about justice. It's not just write about justice, although those things are important and have their place. It's do justice. It's actually rolling up our sleeves and getting involved in justice making in our societies. Now, I want to be clear. I live in the United States. We live in a democracy. And so we have the freedom to express our grievances, our petitions, our desires. Not every country in the world has a democracy. Not every country in the world is advocacy responded to in the same way. And I think it's important for us who are involved in global Christianity to underscore that advocacy does not exact the same price to every Christian across the world. Some of our brothers and sisters pay a higher price. And I I think it's important when we talk about advocacy from a global lens, we underscore that. The second thing is why advocacy? Well, because God is in the process of justice making and peacemaking and reconciling all things. The book of Exodus is actually God's affirmative action for the people of Israel when they are oppressed. And it is using Moses and Aaron as mouthpieces as advocates. The phrase, let my people go, might be one of the first phrases of advocacy in the Bible. When Moses goes before Pharaoh and he says, this is what the Lord has said, let my people go. Literally, Moses is advocating for hundreds of thousands of people. Why advocacy? Because when Proverbs says to us, speak up, speak up, it requires intentional speaking and intentional proclamation. One of the things we want to talk about here in Optica is why don't more churches engage in advocacy? Why don't more pastors engage in advocacy? Why don't more Christian institutions engage in advocacy? What are the obstacles around Christian advocacy or prophetic proclamation? Let me give you a few if you're taking notes and you listen to Optica. You know we often invite you to take notes. Number one, we don't know well what the gospel has to say about prophetic advocacy. Oftentimes, we take a secular definition and collapse it into a gospel-centered definition. And we have this myopic view of advocacy. It goes something like this, this myopic view. Advocacy is just to denounce everything that's wrong in the world. Well, that's half of what advocacy is. For you see, in Scripture, I recommend Jeremiah Chapter 1, the call of Jeremiah as a prophet to the nations. It's not just denunciation. See, a prophetic advocate is not just a critic. Half of prophetic advocacy is to denounce what's wrong in the world. But prophetic advocacy has another side, and that's annunciation. What are you proposing as an alternative to what's wrong in the world? You see, some people rightfully so, have righteous indignation and are angered by the injustices in the world. And let me be clear, 
It's okay to have righteous indignation. It's okay to be angered by the injustices and abuses of women and children and poor people and immigrants and unborn babies, and and the list goes on and on. But it's not enough to just be angry. The question is, what does the advocate, whatever he or she, looks like for an alternative? What are you proposing in its place? Prophetic advocacy is not just screaming at the wind and denouncing everything that's wrong in the world. That's being a critic. A prophetic advocate says, this is what's wrong with the world, and here's what the gospel presents as an alternative, as a solution. And so one of the challenges to advocacy is that it's easily painted as a portrait of angry people yelling at the wind. That's not prophetic advocacy. Prophetic advocacy is sees what's wrong in the world, but also paints a picture of God's vision for justice and peace in the world. It's always two-sided. Denunciation and annunciation. The second thing that I think is an obstacle for prophetic advocacy or faith in advocacy is that we don't know policies well. We don't actually take the time to read through policies and what their implications are for the lives of real people, of women and children and families and people living with disabilities. One of the challenges of much of at least modern Christian advocacy in America, it's where I live, it's what I know best, is that we take out titles, themes, what the little ticker tape that's underneath the headlines, but we don't do the deep work of saying, hey, if I advocate for this policy, What does it mean for women and children? What does it mean for values? And because we don't know policies well, we're easily led astray by whatever party is in power or whatever party we identify with. And prophetic advocacy, now this is important, prophetic advocacy is not partisan. It's gospel-centered. It asks the question, what does the gospel have to say about this issue? What does the gospel have to reflect on this policy? The third thing, and this is important, is that the gospel and scripture is not a policy manual. The the gospel doesn't tell you vote this way or vote that way. It's not a textbook. It's a book of faith. And so what we have to do is do the deep work of reflecting principles from the teachings of scriptures, ethics from the teaching of of scripture, morals from the teaching of of scripture and let me just be honest that takes work prophetic advocacy is not something that christians should enter into lightly just reading headlines and reflecting on the headlines without actually looking at the texture and the matrix of these policies and what they look like in our neighborhoods in our churches in our schools in our hospitals, in our educational systems, in our national budgets, state budgets, and local budgets. The reason that many Christians don't partake in prophetic advocacy is because they don't take the time to reflect deeply on the issues. It's one of the reasons Scripture often admonishes us and counsels us. In all you're seeking, seek understanding. We must be able to see the thing for what it really is. We must have insight, not just kind of a Pollyanna uh, immediate reaction, a knee-jerk reaction to headlines or, or, or the news of the day, but the deep work of Christian reflection and thought. Now you might say, well, we don't know the gospel well, we don't know policy well, and we don't do the deep work of exegesis of Scripture Uh, out of which we deduce and infer public policy priorities. Because, as I said, Scripture doesn't give us the exact answer. It gives us a framework. If you've done that work, the next question is, how do I engage in this work? And I I actually got a text earlier this week that said, "Hey, hey, Dr. Salguero, can you tell me about how we engage in this work? Well, first of all, the good news is you don't have to start from scratch. There already exist Christian organizations in the United States and around the world who are doing advocacy. Things like maternal health 
for women living in Africa and Latin America and their children who are suffering from AIDS or malaria or other diseases that are wreaking havoc to vulnerable women and children. Uh, Organizations that have fought for PEPFAR, which is one of the greatest uh, deterrents to the spread of AIDS across the continent of Africa and other places around the world. And it's important to know that these organizations exist. So how do I do that? Let me give you a small tip. Google, Christian advocacy organizations. And of course, you'll get a broad list because Christianity is broad. You'll get Catholic organizations and mainline organizations and evangelical organizations. And so you have to do the deeper work of searching those organizations to see if they align with your worldview, with your principles, with your ethics. But th- those organizations exist. People, there's Christians who are dealing with the deleterious uh, impacts of of climate in places like Puerto Rico and the Spanish-speaking Caribbean. There are organizations who are advocating to end hunger because hunger is a threat to human flourishing. There are organizations who are advocating for a social safety net that protects women and children, things like SNAP and, and NAP. There are organizations advocating for a pro-life ethic, not just in the womb, but after the child is born, so that that child can have everything he or she needs to flourish. And so that work of seeking what already exists is important work because then you're adding your voice to a choir of voices that's doing good gospel work. Secondly, and this is a novel idea, start a conversation at your church, at your local congregation, with the young people in your church or with the, with the elderly in your church, whatever group you see that has passion around faith and justice. And remember, not from a partisan lens, not from a hyper-polarized lens, but from a gospel lens. And sit down and do that deep work and pick a topic, pick hunger, pick life, uh, pick how we treat uh, incarcerated persons. And when you pick that topic, then you start searching. What does scripture have to say, taking, for example, incarcerated persons? Did you know that most of the New Testament was written by people who were incarcerated, were in prison at the time, or just left prison, like Paul, who wrote many of his letters from prison, or John from an island prison at Patmos, or in modernity, Diedrich Bonhoeffer in his letters and papers from prison, or in Asian, Asia, Watchman Nee, who writes this reflection on, on uh, Christian spirituality in the 20th century. And so the work has to happen, and you find like-minded voices. Scripture asks that question, shall two or three walk together except they be in agreement? And so that work is not easy. I have to be honest. I, I've been working on this and in our coalition and the church we pastor for well over two decades. And one of the major obstacles is that you're afraid to be labeled, labeled this or labeled that. And you have to have the courage because prophetic advocacy takes courage. I started this reflection by saying that prophetic advocacy is not just denunciation, but also annunciation. Let me reflect on that pericope, on that passage. It's from Jeremiah, the first chapter. And in it, God tells the prophet Jeremiah that since he was in his mother's womb, before he was born, God had ordained him to be a prophet. And God gives him this kind of two-sided coin of prophetic advocacy. I have called you to pull up and to plant. I've called you to destroy what's wrong, but also to build up what's right. And so that, that very instruction to Jeremiah, I think, is illustrative to the type of Christian prophetic advocacy we're looking for in the 21st century. And then he says, uh, they're going to talk about you, but I've made your head like flint, like a strong stone. Because one of the greatest challenges to prophetic advocacy is fear. Fear that people will walk away. Fear that you will be labeled. Fear that people will misunderstand your work and call it hyper-political, but when something is right to do, do it anyway. Step into it. Lead into it. Well, listen, it's been great to talk to you. We're always glad to have you in this program, Optica, Reflective Faith and Latinidad, where we're inviting you, we're inviting you 
to open your eyes and see what God is doing in the world. Can't wait till our ne very next episode. Send us your questions. Follow us on all our social media platforms at Pastor Salguero, Instagram, Facebook, all of our platforms. And till the next time, I'm inviting you.